beautiful. We're trying to etch this crap, which is mostly zinc and assorted Teflon junk. Some aluminum. Maybe a little bit of aluminum, yeah. Whole host of things, really. Uh, we're going to try to etch it off with some muriatic acid. 31.5% HCl by volume. Also, we're going to try to hot glue the stopper because we cut this tube by ourselves, and it's not exactly straight. It's jagged on the end, so it will leak out. But we tested some hot glue last night, and it did not react with HCl, so we're going to see if we can, like, stopper this up and clog the holes with hot glue. successful tube sparkly clean when it stops bubbling essentially Good boy. all right so here's Larry he's slowly opening a needle valve that connects the pump up through this rubber hose to our tube we've got our Millator 531 variant or 531 uh, thermocouple that's uh, Basically all that is, that thermocouple, there's a constant current source that runs current through a little filament. And as the gas molecules, as fewer and fewer gas molecules hit that filament, they take less and less heat away from it. And the wire, if the filament is tuned to the, its resistance is tuned to the temperature. And so I think that's essentially how you can monitor very finely, down to the military range, you can monitor vacuum. Alright, so we're reading... 300. 300 millitour. Yeah. This is how we come back to ambient. We have a nitrogen tank. So I'm gonna now flow nitrogen gas. See the, the, the uh, there's the ball right there that indicates the flow. And we're coming back up to atmosphere. You might be able to hear it. Okay. So we will unbolt this guy. CVD graphene via resistively heated substrates was the title of our grant. And we have these heat sinks, these big steel plates that are going to go into the vacuum, which is right there, into the CVD chamber. And those guys are going to get, are going to hold on to this piece of tungsten, this tungsten boat. And this tungsten boat has a resistance greater than the stuff that's in the circuit. And so it will have the most power delivered to it. And it will actually get very, very hot. Let's just show you in a minute. What that does is we put our copper inside the hot tungsten boat. And uh, the copper is what the graphene is going to be growing on. And the heat is what catalyzes, it breaks down the gas and allows the desorption of the carbon add atoms onto the surface of the copper to grow the graphene crystal. So. Um, and vacuum is used so that we can have a pure environment to do the, the reaction in and we can also control what gases are in our chamber. So we're going to have methane, which is going to have the carbon source to build the graphene crystal. We're going to have a hy hydrogen precursor, which is used to help the breakdown of the methane. And we we'll also have nitrogen at the end to bring the chamber back up to vacuum, which you just saw. So the reason this is taking so long is because heat transfer in vacuum is a lot trickier than we thought at first. And so even though we could get things to about a thousand degrees C, which is what we needed our uh, copper to get to for the reaction to happen, we couldn't get the actual copper that hot because uh, if you think about in, in vacuum, there's not a lot of molecules 
that are bouncing around. So you only have really you only have contact heating, as opposed to contact and convection uh, heating, which is what you more commonly experience in like atmosphere. When two surfaces are hot next to each other, you know, like if you put your hand next to a fire, um, you you actually you get a lot of that heat just from the molecules that are very excited in the area and slamming into your hand. And likewise, if you have a piece of copper, it doesn't get very hot because in vacuum because there's not a lot of molecules slamming into it to get it hot. So basically the heating is coming from radiative heat, which isn't much, and from uh, from the contact. And the copper, if you think about it, at the very, at the microphysical level, the copper is, is maybe, ooh, that doesn't sound good. copper foil that will catalyze the reaction. Sonicator. Our super legit denture cleaner sonicator. Don't Works like a charm. Really quickly I'll show you our setup we have to deliver. So the Tungsten boat, I'll put the rating up on the screen right now. Tungsten boat has a resistivity of like 0.01 ohms. So as a result it needs like something on the order of 300 amps is what maxes what it maxes out at. So you put a, you put like a couple volts across it, you get a couple hundred amps, and it gets up to about I think 1800 degrees C. How do we do this? Well, we are going to put 200 amps through it with this transformer we wound. It's got you can see the three the three uh, what is this two secondary. gauge? Yeah, two gauge. in the secondary. We took out if you've ever seen one of these guys, they have a bunch of tiny windings in them, and you can essentially cut those off. Or in our case, we milled it and uh, you can remove it, three wraps in here, and it just happens to correspond to about three volts on the secondary side. So um, what we do is we have this uh, variac goes into the wall and then also into the transformer so we can change the voltage output on the primary of this guy and thus the secondary on this guy. So we have about zero to 2.7 volts, we'll say, range on this transformer. But this thing, super fat wire, so this thing's able to deliver, what, what is it, about 1,000 watts out of the wall, give or take? If you've got 120 volts AC and 15 amp breaker, 10 amp breaker, say it's over 1,000 watts. So if you're at 2 volts, 3 volts, you're doing 300 amps easy. So, uh, yeah, we'll give her a shot. Sorry. Ready? Seal it up. All right. Anyway, one more time. This is changing from zero to 120 AC, which this is stepping down 120 to about three, we'll say, volts. That goes into these fat feed-throughs that we made. Feed-throughs are made with a eutetic epoxy called Hysol 1C. You can get this stuff cheap on Amazon. And what we do is we bore out an MPT fitting. So you can fill this guy with epoxy and uh, with a piece of copper through it, and it'll be pretty freaking airtight. We've been pulling this stuff down to a couple of Militor, and as long as you don't get it too hot, it'll definitely hold a seal. So that's the way to make homemade, slightly jank, or maybe above jank feed-throughs. So anyway, those MPD fittings get threaded into there. We machine a coupler that's holding onto this big fat wire. As you can see, this copper one is running from one heat sink here, into one feed through and then the other feed through's got this guy here. So we're holding the tungsten boat and then the copper is on top of the tungsten boat and it will get just about as hot as the tungsten. So our wish list, we still have our thermocouple to measure the temperature but until now or until then we're just gonna creep up on the uh, temperature and just try to anneal the copper. So let's see what happens. 
plug her in. Give me the green light. That's nice. Okay, so we also have a uh, multimeter checking the voltage across. This is essentially giving us the voltage across everything that's in the tube. So, couplers. What are you looking at? AC volts? Yeah, it's on AC volts. So we got the AC voltage across the couplers and the tungsten and the heat sinks and everything. So, hydrogen is still flowing at the silver bolt 50, half a tour. I'm going to go ahead and start juicing it. This is the most Frankenstein thing you've seen. So if I go up to 10, a voltage starts to develop. It's definitely glowing now. You see it's starting to glow. One and a quarter volts. That'll put us around, I don't know, I really wish we could have a better idea of... The other thing that we're hoping for in the future is to have a way to measure the current through here. I would guess 100 amps would not be... I would not be, uns, I would not be surprised by that. Our feed-throughs, I'm checking the feed-throughs by hand because we don't know how hot these are going to get yet, really. Right now they feel room temp, which is good. So I don't know, I don't know what the magical moment is when this thing starts to anneal, really. One thing that's weird, does it look like it's lifting off? It's wobbling. Why is that? Is that like an inductive thing, I wonder? I don't know. I don't know why it's wobbling. You can still see the copper down in there. That tube's going to get hot, by the way. Not annealing. Yeah, it's hot to the touch. I think we could go hotter though. In the meantime, here's our beautiful rack of stuff. All sorts of vacuum parts. I got some stainless steel tube left over. I don't even know, flashback back arresters that were probably, I think I bought the wrong thing or something. You buy a lot of stuff that you kind of hope will work, that if it ends up working, you're ecstatic, and if it doesn't work, you're like, all right, well, I didn't really know what I was doing until I bought it and realized what to do. I don't know, hindsight's 2020. I messed up a lot, whatever. The high saw silicon, beakers, got all kinds of junk. Here's our copper. This stuff, this is some nice stuff. This is uh, Ceramabond 865. It's a thermocouple compound. Pretty good stuff. I, mean, I was happy with it. Again, box of failure is what this is. An entire package of silicon wafers that said resistivity 0.5 to 2.5 ohm centimeters, which would have been good. But it's coded. It's like some weird. It's not Szyslowski method. This is Szyslowski method uh, silicon wafer. It's like they take a big, big spool of molten silicon and draw it up in this big pillar of, of you know, dope silicon or non-doped or whatever you have, and then you put it sideways and literally slice it up into little pieces or, or into uh, wafers rather. And uh, this is some other method. It's you know. You can kind of see how it's, uh, there's this weird crystal pattern on here. I'm still not really sure. Maybe someone who watches this can put in the comments what this is. I don't know what kind of silicon wafer this is, but it's uh, not Sislowski method, that's for sure. And as a result, it was not good for what we were doing. See how it breaks into really jagged pieces too? It doesn't matter, I mean, we're not using it really. Okay, this is the silicon we were using uh, before. Let me pull one of these guys out. This is P-doped. Uh, with boron, p-dope silicon. This stuff is a 111 uh, structure, I think. So it actually breaks in like triangle shapes. And I can show you guys later how to break it. If you ever run into this, it took me a while to figure this out. A grad student showed me this. But you actually just, you score, you use like a ruler and you score a line and then put it over like a glass slide or something. And you can just, it'll just break along that line. So even though it likes to break in triangles, you can still get it to break into rectangles. Um, that's something I found super useful when doing this project. Because what we were doing was 0.01 to 0.02 ohm centimeters. Anyway, it was right in the range of, I think it ended up being like close to an ohm, one to 10 ohms, which was perfect for what we were doing. Um, Cause we, you know, say you put 50 volts across it, that's 50 amps, um, which some bigger supplies can handle. 
or even 10 volts at 10 amps and you get 100 watts through the thing and it'll get up to about 800 degrees C. So uh, it was working, but we're gonna try the tungsten because it will be able to transfer a lot, heat a lot better with the contact, uh, direct contact to the copper. What else, here's our tool chest. Here's an exhaust hose that we have one running up. See the pump is exhausting out through that black pipe up into the exhaust up there. Oh, here's another pump that didn't work out. This thing doesn't, like, we gotta open it up. It doesn't really hold pressure. TSP from when we tore that thing open. I'll show some pictures. We tore this whole pump open and de-rusted it and uh, made it shiny again. Made the pump great again, so to speak. Acetone, chemicals. Larry's pointing out the jankness of our sample holders. These are our uh, sample 77. These are uh, makeup, makeup holders, makeup mixing containers. I don't really know much about makeup, but I know that they seem to work okay for sample holding. I don't know. Why not, right? Other thing I wanted to point out, the reason we come back to atmospheric the way we do is if you pull out a vacuum with an oil pump and then shut the oil pump off <laughs> without backfilling or without shutting the, see how we have our Edwards speed of valve. These are KF25 fittings, by the way. Um, if, you, uh, if you seal it off, then you're good to go. But if you don't and you come back to pressure, the oil vapor will actually flow back up through the tube due to the, uh, the vacuum that's still in your chamber. And it will try to repressurize your tube with oil vapor. And it's not a good time if you're trying to run experiments that need to be clean. So um, anyway, what we do, like we showed before, is we're going to backfill it with nitrogen and try to pop this, just let this guy take its time. You do kind of need a needle valve for this though, right? Because we shut our pump off and then backfill. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not the best. You can also get like an oil mist filter for the pump, but you know, that's extra money, I guess. I don't know. More than needle valve. So needle valve works. So there's T1, tungsten one. Our first sample with this setup. Doesn't look, so sometimes you can tell if there's graphene on the uh, copper by a slight tint on it. And to my, to my expert eye, no. But uh, it doesn't seem like it has anything on it. But who knows, we have to check under the microscope.